was 8 a.m. A morning like any other. By 1 p.m., I was hospitalized when I received the phone call. By 6 p.m., life as I knew it had changed forever. Within a year, we made a move I never wanted to make to a town we never knew existed. Shortly after, my family was under attack by something. So we ran as far as we could. But it followed. For 20 years, it followed. So now, I've come home. But this time, I'm not alone. With the help of those who have witnessed and those who care about me enough to fight, I will no longer play hostage to fear. I will find answers. I will document the truth. Every effort will be made to end this once and for all. At any and all costs. So help me God. As a first step in this process, I've invited my good friend Ryan Buell to join me. Ryan is not only the director of the Paranormal Research Society. At only 26 years old, he's one of the most experienced paranormal investigators in the country today. I think before we really try to tackle what's going on, we need to understand the whole picture as I remember. And the things that I don't remember, I think we need to kind of fill in those pieces. As far as I can remember, I've, I've, you know, in my childhood, I was extremely skeptical. I was born in Eglin Air Force Base. My father was an engineer. He worked on planes. And Eglin Air Force Base is in the Gulf Breeze of Florida. So when I was younger, I heard all these UFO stories because the Gulf Breeze is world renowned for having a lot of crazy UFO stories. What's that? What's that? Keep, keep, keep recording. What the fuck is that? Where is it? It's hovering. And I used to ask my old man about it. I mean, he would laugh it off. And he'd be like, it's our stuff. We're flying that around. That's what people see. And I remember being very young, and that just stuck with me, how foolish I thought people were, that they would just believe in anything if they couldn't get a one plus one answer right away. My parents, as long as I can remember, it appeared to me as though that they were on some kind of spiritual quest, but they were uncertain as to what they even believed in. I've been a member of multiple churches. They took us to Baptist, Methodist churches, Catholic churches, Lutheran churches, and I used to watch people dance through the aisles and act in a way that I thought was fairly psychotic. It just seemed weird to me that they would, this is a child, you know, that they would talk to nobody that was there. I had heard my whole life when I was younger, you know, up until the age of nine or 10, these stories of the Holy Spirit filling people, these overjoyous moments they had, and I had never felt that, to be honest. I thought it was all fucking bullshit, all of it. When I was about, God, I think it was eight or nine years old, I went to school and I was playing basketball and I shattered my ankle. The next day, I received a phone call telling me that my father had been burned and that he wasn't gonna make it. I mean, that was like an atomic bomb went off. When 
I think back about it, I never prayed once. I never prayed to God once. I had my surgery and three days later, we went to, he was in Houston. And uh, I walked in to see him. And the reason they let us come in to see him is because they told us that he wasn't gonna make it. So, I left and thinking that that was it, that he was gonna be done. And I remember my mom, all the way home, telling me, you just have to pray, you have to pray. And I just almost got pissed at her. I was just like, I just felt like, can we address the fact that our father is gonna be gone? I quit talking about this God bullshit because he's gonna be gone tomorrow and what do we do? So he, he did live through that day. We got the call that, he's still, that, he, that he was still alive. And he was mortified by himself, his body, the pain he was going through. I've, I've never seen a person so in so much pain and so completely broken. I just thought the miracle, I mean, what, who the fuck would want to live like that? You know, I was thinking if he does heal, you know, at the time I'm a kid, I just had no force. I had no forethought. I just, I just saw a person that was destroyed. We're moving to Iowa. And I remember getting out of map and just going, where the fuck is this place? The town was 300 people. When I was in Texas, my class was 300 people. I didn't know what they wanted. I didn't get it, you know? Moved into this house. And I don't even remember how it came up the first time, but it came up that our, our house was haunted. I don't remember anything happening within like the first year or so, but what I do remember is my parents, I, I would catch them whispering about shit, like they didn't want me to know. And I finally started asking harder questions about what's going on and they were saying that, that objects were flying and, and smashing into shit. And they were seeing these black shadow things move around the house and um, at the time, I honestly thought they were crazy. Until one night, and I don't know what triggered it, but I was laying in my bed and I had a water bed. Right as I started closing my eyes to go to sleep, like harder than that even, I hit against my wall. I go into Brian's door and I'm like, did you hear that? He was like, no. And I told him, I said, well, dude, I'm sleeping with you. I'm not going back. And right as we're going to sleep, the same thing happens on the, behind the headboard of his bed. Brian flies up and he's like, let's get downstairs. And he's yelling, mom, dad. And, and as we're going out of his doorway, it happens to the wall there on our way down the stairs next to us. My old man grabs his Bible and he said, let's move, let's get out of this room. And we went in the hallway into their bedroom and threw it to the main entry room. And it just kept happening. It followed us on all the walls. Shit, the banging probably went on for five minutes and then just stopped. And after that happened, things really started getting bad. My mom started acting really weird. I woke up. I had heard my dad downstairs doing his scripture thing again. And I walked in the room and she was talking in some weird ass voice. It was part like broken English and just weird shit and weird. I, I didn't understand it. I remember coming around to the front of the bed and I was just staring there looking at her. I couldn't tell you what it was, but visually it didn't look like her. Like her face just looked different. Like it just looked different. Your mind immediately goes to a place where you want, you don't want to believe it. You want to think it's fake or something. You want to think it's for attention or a show or I don't know. You just don't want to believe it. It just seems like this can't be real. She leaned forward, both her hands to try to grab my throat. And she said something to the effect of, boy, I'm going to get you or I'm going to get you, boy. And I, I, don't, I, I fucking snapped, bro. I mean, like I, 
I mean, I cocked back, and I'm telling you, had my brother not grabbed me, I was going to put her in the fucking ground. Shit still started happening around me in college. Lights would turn off and on, TVs would turn on, shit would move. And it became an infatuation to try to figure out why. I don't know that I ever came to any kind of resolve in Iowa. I, I honestly, I just wanted to get the fuck out of Iowa. Like I was just, it was becoming too consuming. Like it was just what I thought about, was what I read about, and so that's when I moved to California. It just seemed like a town that would have opportunity for my things I loved. But now you say that you're having experiences in your home. Our dogs. Component hobs are going crazy. I'm just getting old. I'm just, I just need to get the fucking sleep. I lost and count of how many times he got up. It's just he was barking like freaking crazy. Come on. Come on. Come here. Come on. Come on. Come on to bed. Come on. beginning part of you talking to me here, you were talking a lot about how you didn't really believe in God, you didn't really believe in religion, which are two separate things, therefore you didn't really believe much in the demonic. Was your mom, did your mom ever have an exorcism? Not to my a knowledge. A formal exorcism. I have to ask my father, but not to my knowledge. Well, there's two things, and I'm just being honest with you. Either she's lying or delusional, or she's been possessed all along, but then something triggers it to come out of hiding. It's embedded like beneath the skin. When you deal with one demonic force, Chad, you're dealing with them all. They are a network. They are all the same, okay? So if you dealt with one in your home, and then 20 years later you go into a possession case in England, it's gonna reference you, it's gonna know who you are. I know this from personal experience, and if it notices that you're looking at it, it's gonna notice back. I totally understand all that. And I get it, and I just, I'm at the point where there, there is no turning back on this. Just prepare for the worst. Why baby blew my way, till I don't know where I'm going. Don't say that you can see me throwing my hand mysterious land. We stand in line for a ticket, no one can find, no one can sign his hand with an eye cramp. What a human is playing, I feel it's visible, makes it easier. To see is invisible. Second stair falls, lies till the third one calls. I'll bite the phone, walk your lip five times. Did you rise with no light in the sky? My fragrant size, hoping that the smell dies. Why well, touch you through the blinds? My seven cents cut off my taste ends to touch souls. You know, Brian's an interesting guy, man. I think I've told you this before. I mean, the guy is, and I'm not overstating this, I mean, Brian is a genius. Brian is an extremely intelligent person, you know, and, and since this process has started, he'll, you know, call me like the end of the world is near and these crazy things are happening, these attacks are happening on him. You know, I watch a lot of stuff and I see a lot of people come on TV and talk about things or whatever. It's not the fucking same thing. It's not... Nothing from my perspective I've seen has been the same as this. The um, thing is, though, I really believe they'd rather, they'd rather kill us than let us go. You know, I visited him with Mary Beth a couple months ago, and there was definitely activity at his place. Well, I'll just do all my, my math and research and any of my thoughts and ideas uh, on anything supernatural. Um, I write it down on this board all the time. Um, you talk to me about maybe laying that off until you're done with the video and just keeping mind fresh and clean while I went to sleep late at night, woke up having, you know, what some people call a panic attack, but I felt like I was being choked or whatever. Um, I relaxed, thought of God and threw it off. And right as I threw it off and came out of it, my board that I do everything on went flying off the wall, um, smashed and broke. 
basically what happened is everything was fine in the house. We lived in it. There, I was never, I didn't have an uneasy feeling. I was fine. And then mom saw an apparition, claimed to hear noises, and from there it escalated to hearing things break, pictures being knocked over, larger objects to finally being pushed and shoved and touched. From there, it was uh, it stayed that way until we moved out. There were times where she would have drastic mood changes. She would go from instantly being happy to mad as you can be, face would change, contorted, you couldn't reason with her, uh, go overboard. And at first, I just thought she was just really mad. But as times went on and these events were more and more, it started to occur in my head. Well, maybe you know she's possessed, or maybe there's times where she is and times where she's not, because it didn't seem right. Because mom's very caring, I know she loves us a lot, and it just was out of place with how much she'd want to cook and clean and do good things for us. Then just to instantly snap and become unreasonable, and I still don't know to this day if she's shaking it completely. There's times that I still think the bad things that happen are still, I think, related to her, and. It's hard to talk to her about it because she doesn't want to really open up. I don't know mom's past completely. I know the family's kind of violent. They lived in a violent area. Uh, Carter Lake was a, a biker town. Um, there was a lot of bad elements, but a uh, very abusive familyhood, or family life growing up, a lot of bad events, uh, brothers being uh, imprisoned, her mom dying. Um, yeah, wh why was her brother imprisoned? Uh, her brother uh, got hooked on LSD apparently when he was in the Marines, and when he got out, he was still doing it in a fit of rage. Uh, he had picked up a stone, and he said he was going to kill himself because he was the devil. He was convinced he was possessed by the devil, and he was going to kill himself and rid the world of the devil. And she was trying to get him not to do this. And if you saw Uncle Butch, I mean, he's a power lifter. He's a humongously strong guy. And he had picked up this huge stone and was going to smash himself with it, and she was trying to wrestle with him. So my mom's brother kills Killed their her mom. mother. Yeah. And when was this? This was before. Was this 18? is uh, 18. Which, yeah. Which was 18. Yeah. So. This is. Uh, he's been in prison for almost 30 years. I feel like this is an ancient old thing that's followed my family around, and I I can get to the truth between Chad and I of what happened in our lives because I'm willing to be honest and talk about it. But I don't know in my family's past, my mom and dad's, exactly what all is truthful there that needs to be said. These are the moments where time stands still, where my desire for answers wage war on my conscience, where the search for the truth has never held a greater value. Yet I fear the process. I have to ask my parents to discuss their worst memories and their greatest fears of a camera crew and worst of all I have to do this in the sanctuary of their home I went to the bathroom to take a piss and as I was taking a piss I thought I heard like the slow growl and so I kind of stopped, and then I heard it again, very loud, very distinct, growling sound. I first thought maybe it was a truck passing by. No, no, this was a growl. And they have like these uh, glass sliding doors for the bathroom. I swear to God, dude, they shook like something was there. So I know we're about to do this interview with your dad. Mom, are you okay to be out here during this? I'm fine. Sit inside if you want. I'm fine. Alright. Hello, I'm fine. Good, 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 good. good. Mm -hmm. This one day I was working on a, uh, on a roller from one of the concrete trucks, the drums that holds the drum up. I was working on it and I needed to use the cutting torch to heat up the nut to remove it. And as I was heating it up, a uh, shop boy who was of uh, Mexican descent, he wasn't legal, but uh, he brought in a five-gallon pail of gasoline, and he set it down beside me, and the sparks from the you know, heating up the nut jumped into that, and I felt all this heat behind me, and turned around, and there was this bucket on fire, and I tried to slide it out towards the door, which was you know, just a few feet away. But as I was sliding backwards, my foot hit into a brake drum, and as I did that, it sloshed out all over me, and then it was on. I think it's safe to say that with you, church and religion wasn't like the first thing in your life. 
before the accident. Is that accurate? That's accurate, right? But this will bring you to God, make you know, come to Jesus meeting real quick. You know, so you look around and you, you're sitting there and you're saying, you know, you know, if I don't get some help, I'm going to die. You know, because you just know you're not going to make it. So your mom would come and she would stand. You all right? Behind the bed. She would stand behind the bed and she would put her hand on my forehead. I just remember drawing, I could feel I'd be drawing energy from her. And that's part of what bored her down so bad. I mean, she was driving 100 miles to this hospital taking care of you. She had a lot on her plate. And so I realized I couldn't draw her down anymore, so I you know, looked elsewhere for help. So I, you know, asked God to help me, and he did. After, I think, the 28th day, I had uh, your mom take me home because I, you know, they'd set me in a tub of bleach water every day. They'd peel all this stuff off and then burn like heck and hurt. And I said, I had enough of this. I, you know, I need to go home. And your mom agreed to take me home, and the doctors all said I'd be back in a week. And, I, you know, if I'd, I'd probably die of an infection, but I never did. I never got one infection because, you know, you took care of me yourself. And you all did a great job. So we found this place in Persia, Iowa, and she was instantly attracted to it since she just had to have it. When I pulled up, I didn't want to get out of the car. I didn't want it. What feeling was it? Yeah, I didn't know. I just had a, uh, just a, a dark feeling, uh, just a resistance, like don't get out of the car. We had a, a series of knockings, thumpings, uh, loud sonic boom type sound. And then things would happen right after that, like, you know, we're here. At this point, I began to question my father about my mother's past bouts of possession. What I remember of this event is I came down the stairs and I knew something was going on because you were saying, I can't remember if it was scripture or something you were commanding in the name of God in the room. And I walked in the room and mom was on the bed and it really, it freaked me the fuck out because I'm looking at her. It does. The power on our main camera, which has been fine this entire time, has went completely dead. I got more cores, I got some cores. I'm going to go back up there. They're uh, troubleshooting it right now, they don't, they don't yeah. know. They, they don't know why it's dead, they don't know why it's on, or they're trying maybe a different stitch of cord to see if that has something to do with it, like, I don't know. Maybe a power surge? But it's coming from the same outlet as the lights, which is fine, which is fine. After replacing a shorted out extension cable and restoring power to our main camera, I continued my questioning. I don't know what happened when I was gone, but it was like it was over. It wasn't. But the weirdest thing about it, I remember, is just visually, mm -hmm. it didn't look like her. No, it doesn't. Okay, let me talk to my mom. Yeah, calm her down. That's why I didn't want her around, because she just. Uh... I've known Chad for about two years, and this has always been the hardest part for him mm -hmm. to share with me, and right. I know you guys are just now opening up about it on camera, sure. but is there anything, you are more knowledgeable about this than your wife and Chad, I mean, you've really studied this. Right. Chad is just now starting to get an understanding of it. I mean, when it, it took over your wife, did it ever do anything to Chad? Uh, no, I mean, she tried to get to him. Like she, attack him? Right. She tried to come at him. Only him or just anybody? No, she, he specifically came at Chad because it said, I'm going to get you boy, I think, something like that. What, is it say, fair to say then that, that this thing ha was more directed towards him than anybody else? At that particular time, it was absolutely directed towards him for some reason. I don't know why. Do you think it would be fine if these guys maybe got a couple shots of Chad talking to your wife? Maybe not in, invading the conversation, but maybe just through the window? 
Well, you can try. I don't know where they're at right now, but let me go in and see where they're at. Fine, just keep going until he's so mad at me you won't talk to me. I'm not. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying. I don't want to go through this if every time you get mad at me at something, you're going to start screaming how I fucking took from you and say shit like, now that I got what I want, I'm out. That is ridiculous, Mom. You just yeah. said that. Yes, sir. That is ridiculous to say to me. What did I say? You turn what around and say, you got what you want now, so leave. And you, and you, I honestly don't remember. You said you took well, from me, and now I'm going to take from it's you. It's trying to fucking... It's trying, trying to, to start trouble with us. Yes, it is. I'm trying to do anything on purpose. Right? It's just shit that's happening. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. What? Oh. What? Oh. Get out of here. Oh. Oh. It wasn't her. She wasn't trying to do that. Did I hurt the cabinet? What happened? I was trying to start trouble between her and Chad again. Yeah, yeah, she got hit. Same type of picture. But when she hit by her? I don't know when I got hit by her. I was talking to Chad and that just went right. I just pushed her backwards and the chair tipped up and she went into the cabinet. My head's okay, but I died mess up the cabinet. She was starting to have a fight with Chad. It they said I said something I didn't say. Well, I, they said did. I said something I didn't say, but I don't remember saying it. Well, you did. That's your fault. Fuck that hurt. Where's my Sonny? He's alright. He's not. Man. He's upset. Of course he is. Sonny? Mm. Here. Oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm dragging this around. I honestly am okay. Okay? Uh, we, need, we need to go. Okay. Right, I need to go. Alright. Okay. Why are you going? We need to go, Mom, because when we're around, the shit does this. No, it did it when you were gone. Dad knows about it, we just didn't it. tell you. Should we call it an ambulance? No, no, no. I take care of this all the time. Ow! Right. Get out! Yeah. You want it By the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, you come out of her now. <laughs> You're alright. I'll leave some stuff with you guys. Alright. Um, this is all been blessed. He's mad at you. Hmm? Okay. He's mad at you, I'm telling you. Let's just sprinkle some holy water on you as well. Yeah. Do you mind? It's holy water. Care. It's cold. It's holy water. <laughs> what are you laughing at? It's so cold. You're fine. It's so cold. Yeah. <sighs> That stuff that one priest put on me burned so bad, remember? Burned you? It was so hot. Really? In, in Persia? And he ran. I don't remember him burning me. Holy no. water burned you? He said it was holy water. I don't think it was because it was hot. You be careful. He don't right. want us praying against him. We're fine. We'll keep it going. No matter what it wants. I was unaware that my mother was still suffering these bouts. I had been told by both my parents that since they moved from their home in Persia, their life had been relatively peaceful. But now, according to my mother, that isn't the case. Why are you going? We need to go, Mom, because when we're around, the shit does this. No, we did it when you were gone. Dad knows about it, we just that didn't tell you. My worst fears just came to life and now I have to make a decision are my mother's issues spiritual or medical or a combination of the both either way I have to come back I have to do everything in my power to lay out a path of resolve and ask my parents to follow and what's even more frightening is when it comes to attempting to bring resolve to my parents situation Ryan and I are not the first who have tried. In March of 1994, a friend of my mother's, who had witnessed the activity in our home, 
contacted what she believed to be the New England Society for Psychic Research, which is the paranormal foundation of Ed and Lorraine Warren, who are world-renowned for their work as the principal investigators in the Amityville and Infield poltergeist cases. Shortly after, a gentleman named Richard Jackson contacted my family and pledged to bring a team of investigators to our home to document the phenomena. Richard Jackson of Woodbridge is a nationally known medium. He's taken part in many exorcisms trying to rid people and places of evil spirits. Mr. Jackson claimed that if he found the paranormal activity to be legitimate and severe, he would then report his findings to the Warrens, who would intervene in attempts to bring resolve to our situation. Over the course of three days and nights, Mr. Jackson and his team witnessed massively intense paranormal activity including chairs being thrown, objects moving of their own accord, and about a possession with my mother, in which she was also physically attacked, as demonstrated in this photo, where her hair is being pulled by an unseen force. When the investigation was over, Mr. Jackson prepared the following notes for the Warrens, in which he also claimed to have witnessed, beyond any shadow of a doubt, the hurling of religious objects, levitations, and holy water having little to no effect, as well as hearing a disembodied voice simply stating, I am Legion. These events caused Mr. Jackson to determine that my family was in fact suffering a devil strength diabolical infestation. In closing, Mr. Jackson reports to the Warrens, we humbly and most ardently affirm the serious nature of this problem and warrant any and all help that may be forthcoming. We never heard from Mr. Jackson again, despite countless phone calls, which would go unanswered. I believe in ghosts in the same way that most people believe that they breathe air. It is not even a question of, of belief whatsoever. And needless to say, the Warrens never responded to the report. Upon sharing this information with Ryan, who is a close friend of Lorraine, Ryan pledged that he would bring Lorraine to Iowa to address this situation and answer any and all questions I may have for her. There was also an additional note that Mr. Jackson made in his report that struck a chord with me. Jackson states, the home is located in a geographical area known for cases of this nature and cites the well-known demonic possession case of Anna Eklund, which took place in Erling, Iowa, which is only 16 miles from our home in Persia. The case took place in 1912, in which Anna underwent severe physical trauma and reportedly vomited her own body weight in a 12-hour time span. Upon studying our surroundings, I also discovered Iowa's most famous haunted location, the Velisca Axe Murder House was only an hour's drive from my home in Persia. Also occurring in 1912, the Axe Murder House had become famous after the brutal murder of the Moore family, which went unresolved, as the killer was never identified. But what does this have to do with my family? Initially, I thought nothing, until I began to look at the dates of these events. The bodies of the Moore family were found on June 12th, which is the same day as my parents' anniversary. And Anna Eklund's exorcism took place six days later on June 18th, which is my birthday. And the bizarre trends continued, including the mass death and suicides from our area of Iowa. I go to a funeral probably once every month and a half. Like, I think we had counted in the last year I went to eight funerals. A lot of them are our friends' family or people we went to school and went with in high school. Um, basically, yeah. There has been in our class, which was relatively small, we've lost quite a few people. I lived it and I grew up with it and it was normal to us. I mean, obviously death is never normal, but you know, something to deal with. But it was normal to us because we didn't really know any different. You know, like the situation was completely off the wall, completely out of character for anything that he would do. How he killed himself in front of his child and in front of his wife was amazing when she was pregnant with their next one too. And then, you know, 
hung himself, waited for his buddies that he was hunting with to come find him. And then he killed himself too with diabetic coma and put himself into that. In fact, since graduating high school in 1994, to date, 13 friends that I personally knew from the area have committed suicide. Most recently, Jamie Crozier, another high school friend of mine, lost her brother Brian to suicide without any known reason or explanation. And that's the hardest thing is, you know, you wake up every morning and you always ask yourself why. Right. And, you know, you play back in your head trying to remember anything and, you know, every picture we have of him, he's laughing, smiling. It was tough because it's a whole community when you're in such a small community and everybody goes through that. But to continually see it happen and you're going home constantly. I've dealt with more death being from our hometown than, you know, most people do out throughout a lifetime. So it has to be something. Even my daughters who are um, six and seven, my oldest one, she always, if you mention Persia, she's like, well, she always talks about ghosts. And I've never said anything to her about ghosts either, but she always talks about that there's ghosts in Persia. And all the kids in their class talk about how there's ghosts in Persia. I don't know if there's burial ground somewhere or something we don't know about or something to uncover, but it's definitely out of character for me. It's interesting that Anne points out the potential of a burial ground, as many in the area seem to share her sentiment. And if you look at the history of Iowa, there is some validity to that theory. Iowa itself, for all intents and purposes, was the site of a massive Indian genocide which began when Chief Black Hawk of the Sauk Indians was captured and forced to sign the Black Hawk Purchase Treaty of 1832, which opened for settlement the eastern edge of Iowa territory, notably Davenport, Iowa. The whole arrangement cost the federal government 11 cents an acre, while those resisting the removal plan were driven out by military force, leaving behind a trail of death and tragedy. Although it took nearly two decades to eradicate the Indians, by 1862, all Indian tribes had given up all their land in what is now known as Iowa. Furthermore, the region where Persia, Iowa sits was the former home of the Potawatomi Indians, who were known for their shallow graves. In fact, as the white settlement front advanced, Sir Daniel Wilson, a British-born Canadian archaeologist, ethnologist, and author, alluded in his writings to certain shallow graves surmounted by small mounds, which the surveyors informed him were Potawatomi burial places. So is it possible that the entire region surrounding my home, which also encompasses the Velisca Axe Murder House and Erling, Iowa, is under some sort of spirit influence from a bloody history begging for its revenge. Specifically, do you think Persia has some sort of weird curse to it? I would say yes, because the suicide right here is so much higher than anywhere else. To me, it's it's evil behavior with all this stuff happening, and maybe it's possibly them, you know, forcing people to make these type of decisions or something. As far-fetched as this concept may seem, one final note from Mr. Jackson's report seems to corroborate this theory. Jackson says that the entity haunting my home oppresses my mother while urging my father to, quote, do the deal. So could it be possible this is all tied together? Or is Brian's theory correct? Is this entire situation tied to my mother and my family? Or is it a land-based haunting fueled by massive residual energy from a great atrocity? Or is this all simply a case of mass hysteria? that we've all fallen victim to. In attempts to answer these questions, several investigators will be joining Ryan and I from this point forward. The first two are my best friends, Justin Holstein and Joe Ansley. Despite having several paranormal experiences in my home, Justin, who's also my film production company partner and a Persian native, remains the most skeptical of my team, especially when it comes to religious theologies applied to paranormal research. There's many different religions that believe in the afterlife. They have a different way of looking at it, you know? So to me, to pick up any one philosophy of it and to subscribe to that 100% is not subscribing to my own philosophy, my own belief, my own logic, my own way of approaching it. 
I befriended Joe while in college through my time spent in the local music scene. After sharing with me his own childhood encounter with a black shadow figure, Joe and I found a bond in our quest for the truth. Chad likes to put me in positions, you know, to see what happens and, and uh, I follow through. I, I do what I gotta do. The third is Mary Beth Wiley, who hails from Waynesboro, Tennessee. After befriending Mary Beth at a paranormal conference and confiding in her about my story, I asked her to return to Iowa with me several months ago to meet my family in order to lend her assessment. Upon returning home to Tennessee, a string of bizarre occurrences began, which included her close friend tragically dying in a car wreck the day she arrived home, her brother and her family nearly dying, an unexplained truck fire during a fishing trip on the following day, and an outbreak of intense paranormal activity in her home on the third day. And finally, to assist us in documenting any potential phenomena, Ryan has also asked his tech specialist and best friend, Sergi Poberegni, to join us as well. Right. I'm wrong. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Are we speeding? Yeah. Everyone all the way? Okay. Okay. So thanks guys for, for coming together, MB, thank you for coming all the way from Tennessee. Thank you for letting us use your crib, yep. of course. No problem. As you can see, uh, Mr. Buell is with us here. You guys know, you know, you, you're... So we just left Des Moines, uh, and we just shot a scene I, did, I think completely didn't work. I don't think Chad's thinking straight. He's trying to make a film, but at the same time, this whole situation with his parents is getting to him. So anyway, now uh, it's midnight. Uh, me and Joe just piled into a car to drive two and a half hours to the Quad Cities, where we'll unload, set up, do a ghost hunt for two hours, and probably get back when the sun's coming up in the morning. Justin's correct. Being a filmmaker is the last thing on my mind. I feel guilty for wishing my mother's issues were purely medical, as seeing a doctor seems like a much easier path to resolve. But what I can't get past is the paranormal activity in our home and over the years that I've personally experienced. And in many cases, my mother wasn't even present. I need answers. And hopefully, the path to spiritual resolve starts in Eastern Iowa. This is the Davenport Bag and Paper Company building, which sits directly on the land in which Chief Blackhawk's army so valiantly battled the white advancement. I've experienced intense activity here in the past, but what I want to determine is when bringing several investigative teams into the building, if any activity occurs at all, is it still focused at me or is it random? And finally, if there are Indian spirits here, will they respond to direct provocation about their bloody past? In this building, there are no reported deaths that we can find in modern history. Now, what's interesting about that is, Justin and I have investigated this place before, and Joe as well, um, but the nights that I investigated with Justin, some of the most responsive activity that I've ever experienced occurred here. You're gonna have to hit something hard. See, if that's you, we still can't distinguish between that. I know that was louder, it's gonna have to even be louder. Holy shit, that was louder, did you hear that was louder? Dude, I am getting... Freak, did you hear that? That was louder. Yeah. Okay. I just asked you to be louder, and you were. Remove something in this room. Oh, shit. Whoa. What was that? Holy Jesus. <laughs> if that was you that just made that little knock, you're gonna have to do it a lot louder. Hell of a lot louder. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. 
it's it's coincidental. I would say it's overly coincidental if something isn't doing it because it's been twice now where you said louder and within the first time it was within a three second period, two second period, something went bang. That time I, I didn't count, but it seemed like somewhere within a four or five, ten, I don't know, second period, something. I want to see what we can capture tonight, see if there's anything uh, that you guys can get, you know, anything that's responsive to you and not just me as it was last time. Hearing protection required here. If there's anybody here, we need to know. Is there anybody in this room with us right now? Hit something. Hit something down here that I can hear. Come in here with us and make a noise. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Yeah. Did you guys make any sounds upstairs over? No, we are totally standing still. We are both uh, sitting down in the office right now. Did it make any loud sound? We heard one loud kind of a ting. ghosts and residual hauntings and all this other stuff. From a scientific viewpoint, it's all bullshit because none of it's ever been proven. Holy shit. Did you hear that? Yeah, dude. I and think look. something just hit the store. Holy shit. Did you hear that? Yeah, dude. I and think look. something just hit the store. We just reviewed the tape. We definitely heard a banging sound recorded on our camcorder and it sounded like a loud popping sound. And it sounded like it came from this door right here. It's stuck. We know that a great battle took place here. Not so much a battle, but a shameful defeat. I'm not gonna provoke a fucking Indian. Yeah, I wouldn't want to provoke an Indian either. No. As far as I'm concerned, we owe them a lot of apologies. How would I explain something that happened to me that I have no... That's a good question. But when it doesn't happen to me or the person sure. who's considering it, then it's not real. Your entire village was destroyed. Whoa, did you see that? Yeah. What was that? Did you see that? Yeah. Your entire village was destroyed. Whoa, did you see that? Yeah. What was that? Did you see that? Yeah. Hey guys, we just, we think we caught like a tiny little shadow ball moving in front of us. Um, we were asking for it to, uh, you know, talk to us because we felt like we understood that there was a great injustice served in this land. That's awesome guys, stay on that same train of thought. Uh, Ryan. Oh shit. What? No, that thing just rolled. I can't see anything. Dude, did, what the? Hey Chad, just, hold on a sec. That was not there before. Well, no, dude, I saw it move. You saw it move? Yeah. Uh, Ryan, sir. Oh shit. What? No, that thing just rolled. I can't see anything. Dude, did, what the? Hey Chad, just, hold on a sec. That was not there before. Well, no, dude, I saw it move. You saw it move. That flew from this table over there. Something very clearly being chucked across the room. I don't know what to think right now. Like literally right where the flashlight is, we were in one of those little tiny rooms. Like literally we were right here and this black thing goes right in front of it. Something was thrown across the room in the basement. <laughs> Something was chucked. I'm gonna have it. Not on yeah. camera. Oh, we don't have Well, no, no, no. We have the sound. I think it was with you guys. Yeah. You know, I really do. So why was the activity focused on Ryan this time instead of myself? And why was it so intense? 
While I'll never know the answers for certain, it should also be pointed out that Ryan is the only one of us who has Native American blood running through his veins. Due to the bizarre coincidence of my parents' anniversary coinciding with the same day the victims of the Axe Murder House were found, Ryan and I will be further testing my brother Brian's theory that there is something negative attached to our family. If Brian's theory is true, then perhaps my presence at the Axe Murder House will incite intense activity focused directly at me. We had a little bit of downtime because of the rain waiting to shoot, so I decided to go into the Axe House by myself and uh, just wandered around from room to room. Looked in a closet and uh, walked away from it and I turned around and was looking the other way and the door shut. And how do you explain that? Do you consider yourself like a believer or a skeptic in ghosts? Very much a skeptic. I, uh, You look freaked out. I'm like, man, I don't know. And I step forward, boom! Seth goes, well, there's a vent here and it's pointed an angle towards the door. So maybe there's a strong updraft. It could have blown the door. So we're, you know, to get enough surface there, we had big books and we were like, boom, like this. Trying to get enough, you know. Yeah, yeah. It didn't even budge the door. Couldn't have been a heater. Couldn't have been an air conditioner because there's no force there in the house. It's just the vent between the upstairs and the downstairs. We're sitting there looking at each other like, how oh, that just happened? We've been standing here for how long? Do you believe in ghosts yet? Well, anytime, you know what? I always say this to Chad. Never a yes or no answer with Justin? Yeah. All right, if you're in here, shut that door right in front of us. Yeah, maybe, maybe there's nothing here. Hasn't made me a believer yet. Ryan? Yeah. Stop. Yeah, turn the light on here. What? A ball just rolled out by you. No. By your foot. Reggie you said I'm not a believer. Look at the ball on the floor. Where? By the door. I can't see shit. Hold on. That's, that's way harder than I was walking. It was right as you said. Nothing's made me a believer. Is this where the son of a bitch was hiding before he offed everybody? Is that what you do? You wait for, for thrill seekers to come in and give them footsteps and shut doors to let them know that the, the axe murderer is here. Joke. You took an axe to babies. You must be fucking sick in your head. Trust me, all the other people who've come into this house are amateurs. You want to show us what you got? You want to prove to everybody that this is the Axe Murder House, the most haunted house in America, that people should be frightened? Well, we are the people. You should be proving that too. Let's go, big leagues. Holy shit. Let's go, big leagues. Holy shit. Let's go, big leagues. Holy shit. Alright, so we've separated. I'm now in the children's room. And Chad's in the attic. What the fuck else do you want? Holy shit. That's the shit I'm talking about. Holy shit. That's the shit I'm talking about. There was all kinds of sounds in the room that seemed to be almost circulating around me.
Can I do anything, Chad? Hey, uh, Ryan, is Chad okay? No, he's in some pain. Right now, it just came on suddenly. But, um, we don't need anyone inside just yet, over. What are you provoking? Well, we're here, of course we're provoking. Right, I, I think this fucking hurts. Keep us updated. Oh, fuck me. What do you think I should do? It's just like a runner. It's like a bad runner's cramp. Like when you run. Is it the same one that you had um, during Opposite that case? side, though. Opposite side. You want to walk you on him? Yeah. Yeah, I do, Ryan. If that was you who was hurting my friend Chad, then do something that confirms it. Take credit for it. Something just moved in this closet. And I just heard something over here. I just heard that. I just heard that. I first thought it was rain. Wait. I heard it. What the fuck? What is that? What is that? Is it you? No, I'm standing. I'm completely still. Something just moved in this closet. And I just heard something over here. I just heard that. I just heard that. At first thought it was rain. Wait. I heard it. What the fuck? What is that? What is that? Is it you? No, I'm standing. I'm completely still. I mean, it literally sounded like somebody's pulling nails out of wood or something. Yeah, yeah. Her. I was totally standing in one spot, not even rocking. All right, man. So you were you were interviewing us earlier today for uh, the newspaper, and um, what did you get when you took the photos? What happened? I took three shots, just one right after the other. The last one turned out perfectly fine. Uh, the two beforehand had looked like uh, it's almost a blur or a white mist right in front of uh, you and Chad. Were you fidgeting with the lighting or the, the flash or anything? Didn't adjust a thing. Um, really? Just push the button three times and that was it. When you've taken photos of people here at the Velisca house, have you ever had anything like that show up? Not of people. You guys are the lucky ones, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we got something around us, Chad. Yeah, makes a fucking surprise. <laughs> Shortly after this interview, I vented my frustration to Johnny about our inability to capture on film the rolling ball, which I personally witnessed, and the upstairs door closing, which Justin, John, and Seth all witnessed. Hauser quickly told me that both are common phenomena and put me in touch with his good friend, Roe, who emailed me the following evidence that he had captured of both events. Activity at the Axe Murder House left us all with more questions than answers. While I personally endured intense phenomena there, so did everyone else, including the film crew. So was the activity truly focused my way, or was it a collection of coincidences? I may never know these answers, but what I do know is my brother claims to be experiencing massive attacks in his own home, and Ryan and I need to come up with a plan to determine if the activity is real. And if so, we need to find out why and make it stop. What do you think is going on inside your house? Nothing. Nothing? Brian, Brian and his nightmares. Didn't you say you woke him up from a nightmare? Yeah. 
What happened when you did? He acted like I was attacking him. And why do you think he was so scared like that? Because he has nightmares. Everybody has nightmares, man. Everybody. You think everybody attacks people when they're woken up from nightmares? I don't know. Maybe. You think it's possible maybe something made him that way? Maybe. That's all I want you to grant me. What we're going to do is we're going to do an investigation first without Brian here. And we're going to do it with you and me, Joe, Justin. All right? Sergio's going to man up tech. As you can see, we're set up everywhere to look at everything. I put Joe and Brian's room alone and have him shut the door. This is America, guys. This is America. And people um, people have opinion. I, I can choose what I want to do. I don't have to have people tell me what to do. You're going in the bedroom, right? Go in Brian's room and shut the door. Why? Because you're a fucking investigator. Get in there and shut the door trying to see what's going on. Okay, fucking guinea pig. Hey, Justin, guinea pig. Hey, Justin and MB, can you guys try doing an EVP session as far away from Joe as possible? Are you totally against the Ouija board idea? Joe, um, lay down on the bed face first. Yep. 10-4, guys. Roger that. I'll do it. Just wondering. Make a noise if you're in here with me. Done. That, I'm done. Jesus, man, are you serious? No, where are you done? I don't want to dabble. Everybody knows that, that I don't. And I don't want to be the guinea pig. I'm always the guinea pig. Hey, MB, I need you to go to Brian's room alone right now, okay? Thank you. MB, same thing. Lay down face first on the bed and ask if there's something there to hold you down. Prove to me that you are here and hold me down. Like you do, Brian. I choose not to invite things into my body. Call me crazy. Call me a pussy. Does Brian have to be here? I'm gonna try the Ouija. I think we should try the Ouija. Uh, homemade, homemade Ouija board uh, test, take one. I want you to hold me down like you do, Brian. That was you that made that noise. Move this glass for us. Let us know that you're here. Despite countless efforts, other than the initial unexplained sound, Justin and Joe would not experience anything further, while Mary Beth reported only silence in Brian's room. But after their investigation, Justin and Joe noticed several signs that Brian had been studying alternate dimensions and laws of physics. Well, what kind of books has he got going on here, man? The physics of consciousness? Distribution of prime numbers? Wow, dude. When Brian returned home, I asked him about the books and scribblings in his room, in which he explained he had been engaging in reverse audio engineering of EVPs, as well as biblical passages. I just want to say right now that uh, between God and I that I believe you had a purpose in discovering these and I haven't messed with these except when I felt it was your will. This has uh, in the past had potential to cause bad things to happen to me. So with that being the introduction, this is the Lord's Prayer in reverse. This is what the Lord's Prayer says if you flip it around. Never help destroy. Hello. Be an elite brother. Mark my name out. And I double with never ending Satan's eternal self. -er. Riots. He leads there. And I surreal. The sun. Night. My shepherd. Say another. Humble kneel. And I her walk with. And I he ruled with. 
her one, her viral name. That is the Lord's Prayer backwards. Yes. I'm going to play that same thing backwards. Okay. And I need you guys to be aware that what you're going to hear is going to be the Lord's Prayer, but it's not going to be in any way you've heard it before. of capturing the activity to further legitimize his claims. Brian wanted to sit alone in his room with the camera while playing the reverse passages as Ryan and I waited in the living room. that you have and he knows our hearts and why we did this Brian will you just please delete that now yeah just delete off the fucking computer done as bizarre as it may seem to record and play such biblical phrases as the Lord's Prayer backwards I completely understand where Brian was coming from although he's recently found religion as a former student of nuclear physics at Iowa State University Brian's also very scientific minded and one can only experience intense paranormal phenomena for so long before the search for answers begins. But thankfully, through discussion, by the time we left, Brian clearly understood that perhaps some doors are not meant to be opened. I kind of, you know, I stumbled onto it and pieced it together and, and uh, then kind of stepped back and said, all right, this isn't my my thing in life, so kind of remove myself from it. So it's kind of frightening, <clears throat> and it seemed like if I went any farther with it, that it was overstepping uh, what God intended. So. Yeah, it kind of feels that way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Feels, I mean, when you hear it, I mean, I'm, I'm not being funny. I'm, I mean, when you hear it, it feels like yeah. this shit wasn't meant to be done. You know what I mean? Yeah. As I left Brian's house, I was filled with anxiety. True to his word, Ryan had spoken to Lorraine Warren about my family's case, in which she immediately booked a plane ticket in order to answer my questions before I returned to my parents' home. By morning, I will look the most prolific paranormal investigator the world has ever known straight in the eyes. And after 15 years, finally, I will have an answer as to why she never responded to my family's cry for help. And furthermore, I'll find out what she knows about the gentleman who led the 1994 investigation of my home in Persia. Please don't tell me it's Jackson. It's Jackson. No. Don't tell me that. Who's Richard Jackson? And he said that he represented us? Not only does he say he represents you, he says that his words should be construed as yours. This guy, from the very beginning, he came up to us when we were lecturing 
and said he would like to be a researcher. It said nobody's researchers unless they, you know, become involved with the classes, and then we if we don't let everybody that's involved in classes go out and do research. I'll have Ryan read you the notes of what they experienced, and they experienced all of it. Their notes are accurate as what they experienced. It went crazy in our house. And they left and said, we'll report everything to Ed Lorraine. We'll be in touch with you. And they never returned a phone call, never spoke to my family again. Of course not. And I don't have, I don't have anything in our records of anything like this. Right. Nothing. Was he ever an official member of Nesper? No, I don't re ever remember him being a member of the society. Did he have any authority to speak on you? Did he ever have any authority to speak on your behalf? Never. Never? Was he dispatched or representing you officially on any cases? No. Never. And, and you never received the notes about no. my family? No, never. Later on, I would love you to meet my parents. I would love to meet your parents. And because I can tell you, this was an, an excessively damaging thing. It was almost like hope is coming and then all hope is lost. To ensure that she had a full grasp of my family's case, Lorraine spent the next several hours listening to every detail that I could remember, from my experiences to those of my family. After learning of my mother's current condition, Lorraine pledged to interview my mother, and if she deemed her to be truly possessed, she would assist in arranging an exorcism. And before we left the hotel, Ryan also spoke to me about the potential intensity of confronting someone who may be possessed, and asked only two things of me in return for his help. One, that I follow his lead during this process. And two, if I truly love my mother and wanted to help her, I would have to do whatever is necessary to ensure that she would receive the help she needs. I made the decision for that house. There was no way I wasn't living in that house. There was no way I wasn't going to have that house. Do you feel that you were drawn there for a reason? Well, I think there has to be a reason that I felt like I was overwhelmed to be there. And how soon after you moved in did you fall target to what was going on? Five days. At this time, did you consider yourself a religious person? Did you go to church? Did you always. You always did? When I was younger. And then I quit going to church and started watching um, church on TV. Was there a lot of fighting and arguing in your home? Once we moved in that home, yeah. You think you, you, you feel right now that your life is all right? With my husband, with my family. I think my life's better now than it's been in a long time. I know it's hard to talk about this with a bunch of people, but when we're looking at this case, you've had these episodes where something overcomes you, overtakes you, that people around you can recall, where your voice has changed, your mannerisms have changed, You've spoken strangely, and we're assuming that's not you, of course. Right. We're assuming that this, and dealing with the haunting that's happened, it seems very likely that's a case of spirit possession. But what we know about true spirit possession is they don't just jump into people's bodies. There's an opening that is already there. And it's not a, a blame game or anything. We're trying to help you. I know right. that. We are not here to criticize you. Oh, I don't even consider you cons that. We're, we're, right. we're here to help you. That's, the reason that we have traveled here is to bring closure. I want it done with. Did you ever bless yourself with holy water? No. Bless yourself with this. No. Why? Because I don't need that. I have God. Bless yourself with this, honey. I just told Why? you no. I just said That's it. That's holy water. What's it going to hurt? That can't do anything for me that the Lord can't do for well, me. But why would you Divine. not want holy water? I bless myself with this water in the name of Jesus Christ. Debbie. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can't hurt anything. This is a bunch of crap here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. Do you understand that? I didn't understand. Only three days earlier, Ryan asked my mother if she would accept holy water. Just gonna sprinkle some holy water on you as well. Yeah. Do you mind? Oh, I know it's that. cold. It's holy water. The Bible tells me 
that I ask God. You, I ask God. I do. I ask it in the name of Jesus what I want, which I do, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, which I do. It says that's all I need. Who says that to you? The Bible. Debbie, there's other things that are wrong here, dear. You're trying to bring out all the good things, the good person that you are, and that you are a good person, but there is something else taking over you that is not talking to us. There is something there. You started with the holy water. You were going to come right up against me. We need the answer through you, honey. Due to the growing tension in the room, we took a break to discuss how we should proceed. At this point, Lorraine made it clear to me that she was not convinced that my mother was possessed. And if she was, in order to receive permission from the Catholic Church to perform an exorcism, there had to be repeatable, verifiable evidence of a possession captured on film. But to be honest, if this was a case of possession, I had no idea how to bring about a demonic manifestation. I'll tell you how to do it. Her one weakness tends to be very, it tends to come out through obscene amount of anger. That's what happened. Well, she that's got, what's obs she got obscenely angry at you for dinner, to which then possibly with the holy water, which agitated as well, which we've already done that to her, and we, coincidentally, she's getting fucking angry again. You're gonna agitate her. I know it's your mother, dear, but we gotta help her. So you're asking me to walk in and incite her until she flips the fuck out with this? You're asking me to do this? To my mother? I'm a grown oh, fucking man. We are responsible for our own decisions. Not you. Oh. 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 Is the stepper or somebody else? You fucking talk to me. Oh boy. You keep you. 
Oh, just stop it. Come on. Leave her alone. No. What is your name? What is your name? Speak your name. Yes, I will. Oh, Say it. speak it. He made me do bad things. A preacher did this to you. Three of us girls. Trust me when I say it's not over. It's not over. What do I gotta do then? An exorcism. Okay. Will you do it? This is gonna require more than us. Chad can't command this out. I can't. Rod can't. Lorraine can't. Has to be a very holy man. You help God. I'll do it if if I can't do it by myself. You did good in there. You did good in there, Chad. Good happened in there, all right? You fucking had courage and you faced that fear, dude. Something very powerful in there just happened. That shit inside of her that was destroying her, it took you to let it out. So please do not beat yourself up. That was one of the bravest fucking things I've ever seen anybody do. talking chat. You have to understand, you may not be able to command it out, but you got something out that you needed to get out. That's what you were meant to do in this whole thing. It's going to take the exorcist to do that part. It's, you're going to have to have faith in him, man. You're going to have to have faith in him. I Stand by his side when he does it. That's the hardest part of all this, man, is how you know me, and having to have this kind of faith is I know. fucking scary. As I hugged my father, it became very clear to me that my mother was not the cause of all the evil in which my family had endured over the years. She was a victim of it. She was a survivor who endured the best way she knew how. Shortly after a group conversation, we visited with my parents about the potential severity of an exorcism and made it clear that it could only be conducted if my mother truly wanted to go through with it. If she believed she needed the help, Lorraine and Ryan would see to it that she received it. And secondly, given the multiple personalities that we all witnessed and the horrific details that my mother revealed about the abuse she suffered as a child, we encouraged her to begin psychiatric counseling, in which both my parents immediately agreed to. While this was not finality, for the first time ever, a potential resolve was placed before my parents. 
But as I drove back to the hotel, I noticed Ryan's demeanor had changed towards me. He became silent and distant. I'm not angry at you, Chad. My job is to tell you to go into your house and confront your mother and make her react because the outcome could be a lot better than the harm. It wasn't easy for me to say those words. It really wasn't. So I felt dirty afterwards. I felt really dirty. If you really want to know, I felt really, really dirty. I asked you to come to this. I asked you to come help me. And at that point, for the first time ever, Ryan, I finally knew why. I don't even know your experience, Ryan. But someday, I mean, whenever you're ready, I'd like to know one day. With me, you know, I had my, my family, my mom, and I love my mom. But then it was easier for them to just say, you know what, he's a child, he's making this shit up. Let's just tell him, we'll punish him if he keeps talking this way. And when my mom would force me into my room, and I would say, Mom, I cannot sleep here. And I'd beg and plead her. I was seeing something, and it was really, really scary. And I knew I was seeing it, and this thing kept trying to attack me. And when I would tell my mom, Mom, please let me get out of this room. Please let me stay with you. She said, if I have to come back in here again, I'm gonna beat you. And so I was very, very quiet. And this thing attacked me and I just couldn't help it. I screamed. And when I screamed, my mom came back and she, you know, she, I guess, you know, she, she, she punished me. It's very weird because if you don't believe in the paranormal, it's like boo-hoo. There are people who get raped, there are people who get abused. But I felt like this was just as bad. Only it's something that not everyone will accept because if they don't have the experiences, they won't accept it. What was worse out of all of that was it didn't necessarily hurt my body, but it hurt my heart and it hurt my emotions. And that's when I realized I was alone. As I listened to Ryan's story, I realized that in a time where my faith in a creator had been consistently wavering, the creator had provided me with everything I needed to believe. Since words can never truly express my gratitude to these individuals, the only way I can ever repay the debt I owe is to heal. And in order to fully do that, there's another step I have to take. Although two families before us that lived in our house in Persia reported paranormal activity, the current family living in our home has enjoyed peace and serenity. After visiting with the family, I asked if I could take a walk through the home at night, in which they agreed. It just seems darker than fucking dark. I don't want to go these fucking stairs. I used to sprint my ass to the light on the far wall every time I had to go up here. Alright, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go first, man. That's what I'm scared of.
was something connected to this home that started this. You should know that you played a big role in making me who I am. Hey, Chad. Yeah. This is probably the last time you're ever going to be back here. Two weeks after production on American Ghost Hunter ended, I received a letter from prison from my Uncle Butch. In the letter, Butch says, my mom gave her life trying to get me drug treatment. The demons were in my mind because I wasn't in touch with reality. And in that way, the devil poetically made me do it. God is a term used to describe universal nature and all that is found within it. The scripture says, I create light and form darkness. I create good and form evil. I, God, do all these things. So you see, Chad, there's no big mystical mystery. Meditate and make peace with God and with each other. And with that, it became obvious to me that the one single missing element in my life that was left to obtain had been buried deep inside my soul beneath 20 years of wreckage. But with the help of loved ones, an incredible family of survivors, and divine inspiration, I finally have what I need to create a future. Peace with God and each other.